you know, there was a lot of anxiety around it as well because death was an option. Death was an option. And um, I definitely trusted Danny's analytical skills with the speed he was going to go and what he had to do. But it was important to keep his body very agile so when he did fall, he wasn't going to break, you know, too many bones or ligaments. This is Andrew Vots, and you're listening to Choose the Hard Way, where the world's top performers share lessons learned at the limits of human experience. What do preparing to jump the Great Wall of China on a skateboard and flourishing as an executive leader have in common? Today, we'll find out. If you enjoy this episode, please give it a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Subscribe and forward it to a friend. Go to choosethehardway.com to sign up for the newsletter and never miss an episode. To suggest a guest or be in touch, reach out to choosethehardway at gmail.com or DM at hardwaypod on social. My guest is human performance coach, Alex Laws. Alex has coached pro athletes to world championships, Olympic medals, X Games, gold medals, world records, and victories at Wimbledon and the French Open. Today, she applies the method she developed over decades of coaching the world's best athletes to help executives and corporate teams reach their full potential. I met Alex in 2005 when she was preparing skateboarding legend Danny Wei to jump the Great Wall of China. And it was a time when she was revolutionizing the way action sports athletes trained. A few of the other pro athletes Alex has coached over the years include Rob Deerdeck, P-Rod, Ai Sugiyama, McKelly Jones, and many other athletes at the very top of their disciplines. In her first career, Alex was a pro triathlete. She won four world championship medals before chronic fatigue prematurely ended that chapter of her story and led her on a quest to help others reach their full potential, first in sport and now in business. You can learn more about Alex at performancelaws.com.au and reach her directly at alex at performancelaws.com.au. You can find those links in the show notes. I met you at Danny Way's house. He was preparing to jump the Great Wall of China. I came down there. You were there. Valerie, his publicist, was there. And I just hung out with, with Danny for the day. When I met you, I could just tell that you had special knowledge. And what were you doing at that moment in time? And what brought you to working with Danny? I met Danny through Paul Check, who was my mentor and you know, I did all my exercise kinesiology training with him. And Danny um, had gone to see Paul when he had that neck in, um, neck accident from the surfing, you know, when he hit his head surfing and broke his neck and thought he'd never skate again. So Paul helped with that. And then Paul and I met organically and just knew we needed to work together. And Paul was um, travelling a lot and he said, I need you to keep Danny, you know, together. And so I became Danny's trainer and, God, we'd done a lot of other work. Um, we, I think we'd broken a couple of, he'd broken a couple of world records already that I had trained him for. But the Great War one was a big one. That was something that was, um, it was definitely next level. <clears throat> he couldn't, you know, we had to build the ramp in the California desert and had to really go through what his body needed to prepare for for this jump. So we had a year and it was he needed to put some muscle on as well um, to handle the impact of of the jump. There was, you know, there was a lot of anxiety around it as well because death was an option. Death was an option. And I I definitely trusted Danny's analytical skills with the speed he was going to go and what he had to do. But it was important to keep his body very agile so when he did fall, he wasn't going to break, you know, too many bones or ligaments, right? So putting muscle on but also keeping the agility in the joints, he's going, what, 80K an hour and then falling to make sure he could actually handle that impact. And to put someone in a training environment that's harder than their competition environment, this was definitely the biggest challenge I'd ever had because, you know, people don't regularly jump the Great Wall of China on a skateboard. (laughs) So how can I prep his body to handle this. So that's where we were at. 
I'm looking at the draft of the story right now, and I think this is actually the final draft. And ironically, the headline I wrote for this story, and I turned this in on August 6, 2005, I titled this story The Hard Way, which <laughs> I had no idea. Here we are on my podcast, which is called Choose the Hard Way. But to give people some context, if you're not familiar with Danny Way, one of the greatest, if not the greatest skateboarders of all time, in my opinion, yep. a legend, okay. an innovator. And I'm looking at the story. I remember as part of the story, they ran one of those. Here's everything that Danny has ever broken, like schematics. Oh, and yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the list. So, so this was before he had jumped the Great Wall of China. And he said, I've pretty much injured every joint in my body. I've broken both wrists, my elbow, blown out my knee three times, ACL, torn, I think the MCL on my knee, tore my shoulder out completely, the rotator cuff, the joint, had to have the whole thing reconstructed, etc. And I also remember as part of the day that I spent down there, we went and hung out with Danny's orthopedist who I interviewed. And if I recall correctly, because I believe Matt Hoffman had had this procedure as yes. well. Danny had had the Gore-Tex ligaments put in uh, as part of an ACL reconstruction, I think. Dead right. Yes, did that over in um, uh, Switzerland and his orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Previte, um, best, best orthopedic surgeons, or <laughs> done some surgery on me as well. Um, he actually accompanied Danny and actually he's working with Danny now doing all this stem cell injections into all those broken <laughs> joints and that right now. Right. Yeah. Mm. And when Danny had the, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that when Danny had that procedure, he was not under general anesthesia, correct? Didn't he have a local and he like watched them do it? Yeah, and he said I'd never do that ever again because <laughs> <laughs> I was trying not to laugh, but because he It's had, not funny, but it's, it's kind of not, funny. But it's so him, like you gotta know this about him. He he you've just gotta support him. Like he's just so next level, you've just gotta support him. There's no there's no way of talking him out of anything, right? Once he sets his mind to it, like jumping the Great Wall of China, you can't talk him out of it. You just have to support him. And it's nerve-wracking being in his support team with these things. So same thing with this. And I was like, why do you want to do that? He said, because it takes so long to recover from general. And I'm like, yeah, true, good point. And I was like, well, if anyone can do it, he can. Cool. When we spoke, he was swearing left, right and centre because the body remembers the trauma right, of the surgery, and he's doing this, like, flight from Europe, and he's just like, it was the worst flight in the world because it was like I was still in the surgery. <laughs> I was trying to laugh, but he's like, I'm never doing that again. Yeah, so you're right. He had he had a local, a local. Totally insane, but very, <laughs> just very in oh, yeah. line with, with that approach, right? And yeah, so I met you at Danny's and I didn't mention this, but I actually had been a production assistant on a film crew when Danny originally, I believe this is the first time he built the mega ramp, which was at Camp X, which was out in the middle of the desert, way east of San Diego, I Correct. think. And I was I was there when he set, I think, two world records and just seeing what went into what ended up becoming a very brief clip, I believe, in the one of the DC videos, yeah. which was heroic. But watching this guy just go all day over and over and over and over obsessively slamming so hard and in such an awful way that it was difficult to imagine him getting yes. up from some of these slams, but he did it. And then to meet you, who was helping Danny to prepare to go do this unbelievable feat. So, you know, you mentioned that... You studied with Paul Check, and that kind of brought you into this line of work. But what were you doing before that? I was a pro triathlete, and um, I had represented Australia four times, won some world titles. I'd moved to San Diego to be with a small group of Australians, and at that time Australia was really heading the world stage in triathlons. And San Diego is beautiful. And um, then... Um, I was kind of forced to retire. I didn't know what was going on with my body and um, I just couldn't handle the training load, which is, which back then was too much, but it was a lot. Um, found out that I um, had some gut issues and I ended up getting a lot of nasty bugs from 
swimming in lakes and canals and all that all around the world and um, decided I wanted to get into this work and then just met Paul organically through someone at a gym and him and I just hit it off and I then started doing all his research at medical libraries in order to pay for my internships and it was some you know I was 23 years of age it was some of the the uh, he really helped for my analytical mind and he'd say here's a theory I want you to go and find 10 articles for it positively and 10 articles against it and I want all the authors and which we're going to try and also figure out the money trail as well and it was really kind of cool um, doing that, looking at both sides of the coin, and that I can't tell you how that has really formed how I think still thirty years later. So yeah, we worked really close together, and um, yeah, so it was ended my pro career as an athlete, which I'd been on the you know world stage myself, been around a lot of sports science as well, and um, then went into that area. When you think about your experiences as a professional triathlete. When you were in the middle of it, did it feel like a job or was it something you had a true passion for? Yeah, good question. It was a job for me. It wasn't, I wasn't one of those that loved doing the high mileage. And now when I look back at it, my body didn't do well with the high mileage. Like the way that people train for triathlons now would have suited me better, but I was constantly exhausted because um, now that I, you know, now that we know biometrics really, really well, I had a really low resting heart rate genetically. So doing the whole 220 minus the age, which, you know, to get an anaerobic threshold rate, I just knew wasn't right. I know. Yeah. So when I finally found out that my anaerobic threshold level um, in on biking is only 155, right? My max heart rate's 169. That's low. And it's not like, you know, the higher the better because I remember at that time Lance Armstrong had just come out of triathlons and was going into cycling. Oh, you know, he, he's got a max heart rate on the bike of 199 and he, he can hold um, VO2 max at 192 and all that. I'm like, awesome, that's great. That's him. That's how his body's made, you know. So that was a big learning curve to me and what that instilled with me is everyone's different individually on their biometrics and that's why, you know, the work I'm doing now today is to find out how your individual and your human performs best, not comparing it to other people, and then using the data insights for that. So it was a very pivotal time because I do feel I could have got more out of my career because it was such a short career had I had coaches and people around me who understood how my human needed to perform well. When was the moment that you knew you had to leave the sport? I just couldn't back up the training. I was so tired to where it wasn't fun anymore. And I was like, there's got to be, I'm competitive and driven, very driven and motivated. And there has to be something that's stopping me from recovering. And so um, I then went and saw some doctors down in San Diego and they're like, your gut's just full of parasites. Like I just, and so the whole gut thing I actually had started working on, but they didn't know much about it back then. Like the protocols were really hard, like go on some gnarly, gnarly antibiotics, which, oh, you can't get here, so I had to go over the border to, to Mexico to get the doses to kill these bugs. And um, it kind of put me on that path, you know, hence the conversation we had before we started recording about me going through something that I had to figure out a solution because science hadn't caught up with it. And so I think that that experimental component has really shaped the work that I do now, you know, to help other people. So, yeah. What was your emotional experience of leaving the sport? Did it feel okay? It, it's, it's really interesting. It did actually. I knew there was something else I had to do, you know, and – as I said, I wasn't one of those that loved jumping on the bike all the time and running all the time. Um, and then once I left the sport, I found Paul very, very quickly. And I was like, this is what I want to do, you know. And, and where that was good is even when I've worked with, you know, the tennis players and other people, is I do understand the mindset of being on the, on the line at world championships, being a favourite, having all the pressure of the media, and that was something that a lot of them said, you've been there. And unless you've been there, 
it's really hard to un- to understand what an athlete of that caliber goes through and so I think it served its purpose my short career and what I'd gone through it definitely served its purpose to then help me do the bigger work with all the different pro athletes I worked with over the over the next 25 years what do you know from those experiences that you had of being on some of the world's most competitive intense stages and some of the most arduous athletic competitions on the planet. What did you learn from that? And what yeah. might normal normal people or people who don't have those experiences, what might they misunderstand about what that's like? Brilliant question. Brilliant. Because there's, there's one answer and it's a brilliant question. Something I noticed with the athletes and something that was denied with me, with my coach, was listening to their intuition on what their body needed to perform. They actually know at that level. And so I wouldn't tell them what to do. I would open up conversation to get out of them how they felt, right, what they felt they needed to do. And then I would provide solutions and then they would pick that. So I allowed the power to stay within the athlete at all times, right, because they know their body better than anyone, right? And I was denied that, right, with the heart rate. Oh, you're not working hard enough. You're only at 165, you know, with your heart rate. And, again, him not listening to me as an athlete. I'm like, I can't go any harder. This is hard as I'm going. And I got belittled for that. So I so I always respected that with my athletes. And then with the work that I'm doing outside of athletes and just high-performing individuals, that is my mission as well, is to help educate people on how their body's performing through biometrics and, and data-driven insights. Because when you get empowered on how your human works, you can navigate through just about everything, anything. And I think that's really important. And it's, I don't know whether we've we talked about it even before. I feel that consciously we've gone so far away from, um, okay, so I call it left brain, right brain consciousness. Left brain is like caveman era. Let's look at that. They understood and felt the earth they actually knew the foods to eat they knew all these things on how to survive right then we go post-industrial revolution we've given our power away to a lot of medical pharmaceutical oh no just do this just take this and we've lost this um inner guidance on our bodies and how they should function optimally and we've given all our power away and that's why we've got a very sick um human race at the moment and so that's that's part of my mission at the moment. Same with the athletes is to get the best out of them and get their body performance to where it's where it should be. And with that, with all the data driven insights we've got now, it's a really good accountability and awareness on where your body's at and what you need to do to improve it. So I'm very I'm super passionate about it. And when you think about an athlete like Danny, for example, I just read that list of injuries or if, you know, if we were in American sport, if we were to look at NFL players or rugby league and other contexts or any of a number of sports, these athletes, and I think we see the same thing in other domains of high performance. And Alex, I definitely want to hear your take on this within the context of the corporate world where I think a similar but slightly different thing happens. But these super high performing individuals actually have the capacity within themselves to go beyond what the machine itself can handle and go like run so hot that the machine blows up. And that's when you run into, you have to take risks in these contexts, but that's where some of these athletes, their bodies literally are torn apart, right? Yes. Or they end up, uh, just as part of their jobs are in a context where they're exposed to injury and, and risk at a very severe scale. So when an athlete's on the line, for example, they're preparing to compete or Danny was preparing to jump the Great Wall of China or one of your tennis players on the world tour, I'm probably not calling it the correct thing, but whatever the tennis yeah, world t- tour is. Yeah, tennis tour, yeah. Yeah, the tennis tour, when they're preparing to step into competition, how do you help them tune into perhaps being gentle with themselves in a context where what's rewarded often is just redlining it, right? Yeah. Well, it's a good question because each athlete, their schedule's different. So tennis is week after week after week. 
they had to be in tune with that. If they blew themselves out, they they may not be able to compete at, um, for the Grand Slam in three weeks. So it was very meticulous on making sure that they, when they've pushed the needle too far, that they stop, right? However, we did end up coming up with formulas to where they were just never injured. And when they're never injured, they were able to, so tennis is a perfect one. It's hard. It's, you know, 10 months, 10 and a half months of the year. They are every single week competing. It's it's one of the longest. I know cricket's long as well, but cricket's a team sport. I'm talking individual sports. Tennis is really, really difficult. And if you miss weeks, you actually, your ranking drops, right? And then you don't get seeded. So I actually, with my player, Aisul Giyama, it was actually just announced at the Australian Open, a little side note here, she still holds the record for most consecutive main draw appearances in Grand Slams, which was 62. That's 15 years of showing up to four Grand Slams in the main draw every year. Now, yes, there's some great genetics there as well, but my job was to keep her injury free. And so she, you know, finished her career number one in doubles and number eight in singles, right? She got her body to the best she could because she kept it injury free. When you keep the body injury free, you can keep, so it's even with high performing people, it doesn't matter whether you're a pro athlete or just a high performer. When you get setbacks of illness or injury, you could have been on the precipice of just having this massive breakthrough on a skill or a something and then boom, now you get to take care of your human, right? And that's why it's very devastating for athletes when they get injured. And I would always be, well, you, you know, the injury is a highlight on a weakness in the body. We need to figure that weakness out so it's no longer a weakness. So we did that with a lot of them. But with Danny, because he was going hell for leather, he, he had to just go all out, but we knew we had a couple of months to recover, right? So we strategically, so the Great Wall of China was, was hard because he tore lig- a ligament off his ankle and we had to back up one month later X Games, of which he still won the gold medal. Then he went into surgery. <laughs> so his is a bit different where he's not doing it week after week. So he, he was the type of athlete that just went balls to the wall, right? So... It depends on the athlete and their schedule and what time they have to recover. But back to the corporate um, connection that you just said there, that's why this program I've um, got in this app I'm developing called My Threshold. What is your threshold that you can push yourself to without breaking down? Because especially as leaders, if, if you're breaking down, then you're not good to your team. You can't achieve what you're supposed to achieve. And, I, and it's like, you know how we, you know, the, you know, the training cyclists and triathletes and all that used to do back in the, um, um, back in the 90s. It, it, they've shown it scientifically that it's just not sustainable, right? Everyone's getting, you know, all these different weird issues with their body, immune system, cardiovascular issues and all of that. It's the same thing with corporate now. To work a 40, 50 hour week now is really hard in today's day because of, of the technology age and the amount of information that our brains have to go through is, is 10 times more than what we had to do five years ago. So we need to put those restorative components in to keep up. And if we don't keep up, you know, it, it's a slippery slope. <laughs> no, that's great. And when you think about that, in particular, the athletes that you worked with, and I am really interested in how you're transposing this into the, the corporate environment, Alex, and what you're doing now. But with the athletes that you worked with, I'm imagining that they all had varying degrees of ability when it came to yeah. tuning into that inner voice. Yeah. So what practices did you work with athletes on to help them get more attuned to what their body and their instinct was telling them? Good question again. So with Danny and Sugiyama, they naturally just had this strong mind that I didn't have to do anything and it was very admirable. Um, And it wasn't until then um, I decided for myself, I think, uh, um, so Alyssa Ronick from ESPN was doing a lot of articles with me. She was se- She's still senior editor of ESPN. And uh, we used to ride um, from um, Santa Monica to Long Beach and back, you know, a couple of times a month. And uh, I said to her that I'd, I'm going to do 
uh, Kundalini yoga teacher training to get my stress level down so I could get pregnant. And she's like, I think you're going to, um, this is going to help your athletes and that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is for personal. I'm doing this for me. Anyway, long story short is some of my athletes started seeing obviously some sort of shift in me. And those were the ones that didn't really mentally have what Sugiyama and Danny had. And it started shifting them um, with breath work and meditation. And it was so powerful. And so that was more later on in my career. And um, it was brilliant to see. I absolutely loved it because some of these athletes had had already done hypnosis, um, sports psych, and I'd done a lot of sports psych myself as well. And it was through meditation and breath work that totally shifted my mind. So that's becoming really big. And I remember, oh, God, this is a really cool, cool story. I remember when I was going through the training, Alyssa said, I'm doing an article with the Seattle Seahawks right now. And by the way, they're doing some of the type of yoga that you're doing. I said, awesome. Can't wait to see how they they go this season. So she followed them through the whole season, right, to do this huge um, article. Well, they ended up, it was when they won the Super Bowl, right? I can't remember the year, right? 2012, I don't know, somewhere around there, right? They hadn't won one in 36 years or 46 years. It was a long time. And I just loved it because obviously it was something that I was going through and seeing with my athletes and then to see it in NFL was amazing. And so I, I love that space and what, um, how like, you know, the yogis and the monks have known for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, the benefits of mindfulness and meditation. And now it's becoming pretty popular. You know how it is. Like you have moments in your life when you meet certain people and you just know like, wow, this is an incredibly, special person. They have special knowledge. They're charismatic in a certain way, whatever the case may be. And I could tell that when I met you at Danny's house and I could tell you had really deep knowledge about training, about recovery. You were way, way ahead of your time. And I did that article, I believe in, well, I have the date in front of me. I did it in 2005. But I think at that moment in time, you must have been the first or among the first people to apply that level of sophistication to training action sports athletes. Is that correct? Correct. Why do you think that wasn't happening before then? And what led you to bring all these methodologies into working with these athletes who prior to that hadn't really used that type of training? Well, with action sports specifically, and it was quite a journey actually because it was very taboo for them to actually train, right? There's there's definitely a culture with um, action sports athletes. And so a lot of the boys at the beginning would be like, yeah, no, don't say anything, nothing in in interviews that we're working with you. And then over the years that started changing to the point where I had certain athletes um, put me on retainer and I couldn't work with any of their competition. Um, Because, and then with that training, I saw the trajectory increase of the sport. You know, it's now, you know, a lot of components in um, skateboarding are in the Olympics now. And I watched that journey to be an Olympic sport, which was just fascinating. But it it really shifted it. And to be a part of, you know, that group of guys who knew that they, their bodies were getting abused and they were having short careers because they just couldn't um, recover well. And I mean, it's a really hard, I mean, they're smacking concrete. They're not falling on the grass. Like, like a lot of other sports, they are hitting concrete and they're not hitting it from the ground. They're hitting it from like three, four, sometimes 20 feet from the ground, right? So <clears throat> it was really kind of cool to support them and I learned a lot. I, 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 I really learned a lot, I have to say, um, because I wanted them to have the outcomes that they so desired. So that's really, really pushed me to keep ahead of the curve to where, you know, I was working with nearly all of them and they would fly in and work with me and, you know, would, as Alyssa said, you put Humpty Dumpty back up on the wall again. So with skate, with action sports, that was that. With the other sports, to answer that question, um, again with tennis, it wasn't very – well, firstly, you had to be in the top 10 to afford someone to, to go on the road with you because it's so costly to go on the road. Um, but as Sugiyama started seeing the investment in me, actually she ended up making 10 times – or 
a lot more than that because her ranking stayed higher, right? Her sponsorship endorsements got higher and so did her prize money. So it was actually a good investment. And now pretty much all the girls inside the top 50 to 60 have someone. So, again, it was just watching the evolution, which was kind of really, really cool. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, and just also keeping them injury free is it was just my – because I, I didn't retire on my own terms with my sport. And that was a pack that I made with all of them. I, I will guarantee you'll retire on your own terms because, yes, even though I was obviously ready to retire, it wasn't my decision to retire then. You know what I mean? And that's hard for an athlete as well. When they're forced to retire because of an injury or something else, it's it's devastating mentally for them. And with the action sports athletes in particular, so I know – I I wrote about Danny. I later wrote about Rob Deerdeck a couple mm. of times. Mm-hmm. And again, like I would show up at these for these journalism gigs. It's like, oh, there's Alex. You know, you were working with Rob at the time. We were down at the Fantasy Factory, mm-hmm. which was super cool. And then later, you also worked with P Rod, correct? Yeah. Yeah. How did it work? Would you just would you be working with an athlete exclusively? I'm just curious about the mechanics of this. Like, what what was your relationship like, and what would you do? P Rod ended up putting me on retainer and I couldn't work with anyone else um, in street, right? But I could work with Danny. And so because he had me on a very um, nice income, I pretty much had to ask him, hey, can I go help Danny do this world record? And as long as it wasn't um, in competition with what he needed to do and then him owning a lot of different um, skateboard companies, he would then bring his, his crew in from those. So I'd work with them. Rob wasn't competition because he just was at that stage trying to just stay healthy to do the the endless filming that he was doing. Um, And that that was really interesting. I mean, the demand on his body was massive for that filming because he did all those stunts. He was getting injured left, right and centre. It was was intense. Yeah, I mean, you see the footage on some of the stuff. Um, He got severely injured in um, one of them as well. a total hip and back problem that w- he's just getting on top of now. Um, and so then when the tennis would happen, I'm like, hey, can I just go work with this tennis player? And they're like, yeah, 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 off you go. So that's how it ended up being when I was in LA when I saw you then is um, Paul just had me exclusively. So, But I was able to work with other athletes here and there as long as it didn't conflict with his schedule and what he needed to do with me. And we would meet anywhere from three to four times a week um, some of it would be mindfulness, some of it would be mobility and recovery, some of it would be strength, depending on where we were in the season and what we needed to do. Um, but, yeah, so that's kind of how it ended up working. I never <laughs> thought it would, but, yeah. And during that period of time, you mentioned this in passing, but I'm really curious about this because you were bringing all of this knowledge, all of this expertise from all of these different modalities and disciplines, and you were always – and continue to always go deeper and learn more in your practice, whatever it is. That's just the kind of person that you are. But you mentioned that you also were learning some things from these athletes. So oh. what did you what did you learn from them about high performance? <clears throat> well, what, what's really cool is when you start working with someone <clears throat> for years and years and years, you learn more. When you just work with someone for a few sessions here and there, I was just like, oh, I'm not learning much here. But the more... More The more athletes that I had for longer periods of time, the more things we would uncover. So you just keep going through stages. And so that then increased my um, probability box, right, on what could happen here. Um, also, I learned things from tennis that I applied to action sports and vice versa and other athletes, Olympic athletes. I, I don't know. I always... I always go into, I mean, still to this day, I'm learning as well. I love learning, right? I have such an open mind when it comes to learning. And I feel that each experience just keeps increasing my depth of knowledge to where as I went along, I was able to troubleshoot very quickly and very effectively because I've had so many laps with so many different athletes with so many different probabilities that I was able to get right into the crux of the issue straight away. Um, So I guess... Looking back on it, it used to take me a little bit longer 30 years ago. And then at 20 years, I got faster and faster because I was so open and really tuned into what was going on with each person individually, what were their needs, 
What were their problems? What was the solutions? What solutions worked and what didn't? Some worked for some, some didn't. And so the probabilities were huge, but then started honing in on like, okay, this person needs this, this and this. And I have to say it's almost intuitive now, an intuitive sense that just helps me with the people I work with now hone in very, very quickly on what they need. And sleep recovery, these are such popular topics and popular culture right now, both in the world of business as well as in the world of high performance sport. What was the dialogue like around that? I don't know, like around the time that we met in, you know, the early 2000s, was that even part of the conversation? No, sleep was, sleep was nothing, um, which was interesting. I mean, yeah, as an athlete, you're tired, you go to sleep. One thing I did, the only component on sleep was some of the action sports guys would go to bed super late. And the only data we had is, um, you know, getting to sleep between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. increases the production of growth hormone and growth hormone you need to be able to recover. So once I started getting my athletes to sleep around 10, 11 o'clock at night, they noticed their recovery rate would would improve. Um, And then recovery, we were always working on inflammation, right, whether it was hot, cold, lasers, you know, whatever that was back then. Um, But it's always definitely been, um, uh, it wasn't as, as popular as it is now because we've got the insights, right? So to me, it was injury prevention and recovery. Now what a, what my focus is is sleep and recovery. And now with all the, the wearable technology and, you know, I use a clinical wearable, the sleep component to me is the lowest hanging fruit and it should be the, the first thing that anyone looks at because unless you're getting good quality sleep, you're not recovering, you won't have good mental health, Right. And it's really hard to keep up unless you know you sleep. And unless you're assessing, you're just guessing. Because I thought I was getting a good eight to nine hours a night. And when I started looking at my my deep sleep data, I was only getting two hours. So I've put all these protocols together, which I'm now getting four hours of deep sleep a night. That changes, you know, the way that you function and you recover. You know, uh, science has also shown that um, after a, a woman gives birth to a child, because of the sleep deprivation in feeding the child every couple of hours, the brain actually shrinks. And, you know, and that's what, you know, we'd call baby brain. Well, it is very, very real. So I had to do a lot of recovery after um, giving birth to my son seven years ago because I'd already had a sleep issue. And there are some genetics involved with that as well, but it is what it is. Just look at the data. And even now, more so with our brains having to compute so much more than what we did five years ago, our, we need that deep sleep because deep sleep is that restorative neurological recovery, right? And so it's a fascinating area now. But also, you know, we've got HRV now as well, looking at stress levels, right? What, what is stressing you? I mean, I can now measure with my wearable and show people the benefits of, of just a three-minute breath work on your HRV, you know? And I think that's, that's the future for right now. And it's taking, and also with that, and the athletes who are getting good sleep and are recovering well, they're having longer careers. Is there a specific breath protocol that's three minutes long that you like to use for your HRV purposes? Yeah, well, um, I like I like the box breathing, you know, and you can go in five, in for five, hold for five, out for five, hold out for five. Um, I love alternating nostril right? Alternating nostril balances left side, right, left hemisphere, right hemisphere of the brain. Um, and then there's another one that I love, um, which is called the one minute breath where you just breathe in and you hold, um, you breathe in for 20 seconds, you hold for 20 seconds and you breathe out for 20 seconds. And it's super powerful. That's great. I think I've, I've probably tried all of those except the last one. So I might, I might give that a shot. I was digging into the literature and I was looking for meta analyses a while back related to alternating nostril breathing. And then I looked at the literature around single sided nostril breathing and yep. I, it seemed inconclusive. I didn't feel like the sample size was large enough for me to have a high degree of confidence in it, but I did see data suggesting that if you did left side only that it activated the parasympathetic nervous system and actually could really help down regulate stress yes 100 percent. and then right side 
Um, so that's another one that I that I use as well. Is if you just you, if you get activated during the day and you just need to relax, just doing left nostril, but don't do it while you're you're driving. But if you feel you need to kind of have a bit of a pick me up, right, that you can do right nostril. But for a pick me up, I do breath of fire. So that's and I'll do that before I go speak. Um, and present, and I actually do it every morning because it just wakes everything up for me. So all the breaths do different things, um, but definitely left nostril um, is definitely more parasympathetic for sure. You mentioned how you ended up pursuing the kundalini teacher training, but how did you originally get turned on to kundalini? So I tried a bunch of other yogas, um, um, even down in San Diego, we've got the, the um, what is it, the Self-Realisation Centre down there. I used to go there and nothing was really hitting me um, that much. And then, you know, organically, uh, and I know we've discussed this before, like I just had three people introduce me to Kundalini Yoga. And when, when, I, when I have at least two um, source, different sources of information on something, I pay attention to it. And so I went and did my first class and I was like, oh, my gosh, I totally get this. And I haven't stopped since. And that was over 10 years ago. And that's uh, it was just an absolute game changer for me. And it's definitely, um, as I said, I'd done um, vinyasa and hatha and I just found it was I've got a very active mind. Um, Athletes are very active as well. There's so much going on in Kundalini. I can't think of my to-do list because there's so much going on. And, it, you know, it was a yoga, a yoga just for the gurus as well. Um, it, was held, it was kept quite secretive for quite a while until the, uh, the 70s. And, um, and it is. It's, I mean, we call it the yoga on crack. It's fast and effective. And especially with athletes, they want instantaneous results. And this delivers it straight away. It's amazing. I, I absolutely love it. How long was the training? What did you do? Um, the training was every other weekend for six months and they uh, and like it's two and a half days like you'd go in friday night at six o'clock you'd finish at about 11 up the next day at eight full days full days it was exhausting um but it was uh, talk about an intensive training um and it was definitely an experience as well and doing that while working and then i fell pregnant by the second weekend so i did most of my training pregnant which added another element of difficulty as well, just being tired and nauseous and and that. But um, it was very profound. It was very profound for sure. So today you're in Australia. Like yeah. You've been back yeah. in Australia for a minute. And we've talked about all of these amazing experiences and adventures that you've had and your path of learning and all of these cool things that I think for most people are just in the domain of fantasy, just getting to imagine working with athletes of the caliber that you worked with and the experiences that you were just having day to day. There are things that I think a lot of people just fantasize about achieving in their lives. What led you to walk away from all of that? Yeah, I just, um, well, firstly, I, ha- I finally got, I did get pregnant um, and had my son in LA and um, I just found that, I had achieved everything I wanted to achieve there um, with those athletes and not just athletes. I worked with a lot of entertainment people and I just knew I needed a change and being a single mum in LA was very intense, I have to say, very intense. And I had a non-sleeper as well. So that put another level on top of. Um, I had a kid that just did not sleep. And so it got to a stage where I I just wasn't even functioning and, you know, I kept flying my mum over from Australia to help me. I had as much paid support as I could afford, um, but, you know, not, night nannies are, are 400 a night and I didn't need just one night. I needed a month. <laughs> and so I started looking at, you know, raising my, my son back in Australia and having the support of my, my mum, which um, was something I wanted for her and my son as well. And so I came back here to just you know, have a new adventure and uh, sports wasn't where it fit here. Um, It's very different here. Most of the elite Australian athletes live overseas anyways. Um, So unless you work in, um, you know, the team sports here, which is is very, uh, it's not, I tried it, but it's just not for me, put it that way. 
Um, it was, it's way too close-minded for me. And as I think you can see, I need to be open-minded to be able to do what I need to do to deliver the results I need to do. So it took a couple of years to figure that out. And then I had um, this guy who tapped me on the shoulder one time at a, at a sports convention saying, I'm interested in how you can take what you're doing into the corporate sector. And so I've spent about three years dissecting why and how I got the results I did with my athletes and how how would that translate into someone who's not trying to break a world record or win Wimbledon. And that's where I've come up with my zero gravity program um, using the quadrants and then using a clinical wearable as a um, um, biometric um, data-driven device. And how are you applying that practice now? I'm doing corporate group programs right now um, between 10 and 20 people. I do do one-on-ones as well and um, pretty much educate you on your data and what it means and why it's important and then how do you change it? And I think that's the biggest difference is a lot of people don't know how to shift their data. Like, well, if your sleep's not good, what do you do, right? If your HRV is not good, what do you do? And so I take the four quadrants that I found that, when, when you get all of those working well together, then you can actually change the data and you can perform better. So it's definitely educational. Then I take you through an experience yourself because your experience is way more powerful than, than me having it. So again, like I worked with my athletes, I want to educate you on you and I want you to have your own experience because that's where you're going to turn the dial the most, not me telling you what to do. That doesn't work. I I. I I figured that out when I was working with high ego people that just, you know, you've got to actually work with the person and educate them. And then they have these incredible insights that um, they learn about their themselves, which are life changing. They take it on for the rest of their life. So that program's eight weeks. And um, then there's, um, then there's some other ones after just to kind of keep the light touch. But that's why I'm developing this app at the moment to keep the accountability up because it takes a good three to six months to instill good behavioural changes that become routine, right? So I know you've got a lot of routines. I've got a lot of routines that are just normal for my performance, right? But a lot of people don't know how to achieve that. So that's why it takes a little bit longer for some people. But having that awareness and that accountability um, is what I'm creating through the apps and through the education. Since you moved back to Australia and, you know, you became, you became a mother as you mm. shared and you, you had uh, a son with some pretty intense sleep habits, it sounds like, which is a very, very intense experience for anybody to have. And it sounds like that was really challenging. But going through those experiences, going through this shift, and how you're applying your expertise. Has your sense of what is important or what gives your life meaning, has it changed at all? Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, they change everything. And it's even more so now because I, because I am a mum and I'm responsible and accountable for him, I have to be on top of my game. So it's raised my game in a different way because obviously I don't have the time to do all the training I used to do before, but I've had to change the way I take care of my human as well. And sleep to me is something, well, I'm sleeping nine hours a night, but is my quality good? And it wasn't, right? And so once I started changing the quality, oh, I'm waking up rested now. But oh, you know, becoming a mother, it just, it it does, it shifts every, it's shifted everything for me. And it's been great. It's been awesome. I do believe having him shifted my trajectory to do the work I'm doing today, which, by the way, I'm just now starting to have that feeling like I did when Danny jumped the Great Wall of China, when Sugiyama won Wimbledon. When I get people who the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, my gosh, my life's changed, that, that, that's why I do what I do. And I love it still. And it just had been a while um, since I'd had that feeling but I just, oh my God, it's just the biggest high for me when I see that with people. So, yeah. Have you had to organize and operate differently as you've gone into this entrepreneurial mode and like you've been in this building mode as, yeah. as you've brought this product to market, as you've, you've created your own startup, right? And it sounds like you're applying a lot of the things that you learned in your 
previous paths as a professional, but it's a really different kind of business to build. Yes. And did that did that feel exciting or did it ever feel scary? It's exciting because I'm always about the outcome. It's such a good question, Andrew. It's scary because there are other things I'm not in control of, right? And when you're working with an individual, it's a lot easier than when you're working in a group, right? And you've got so many people to make the decisions, right? That's hard for me, I have to say, but I keep going into the outcomes I want to achieve for people and have that feeling. Um, So there's a different mentality compared to the athletes. Like the athletes already have accountability. They already have some level of awareness, right? They want to win really badly, right? They have a strong desire, right? That makes me applying protocols and testing what's best for their human much easier, right? This area, it's not everyone's in that boat. And that's been hard for me because I used to, I've realised I can't want it more than you want it yourself, right? Otherwise, I just spin in circles and it, you know, just wastes a lot of time and energy for me. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges is when you can see that someone needs it but they don't want it, um, that's really, really hard. So I'd have to say that's the, the scariest part and I've had to navigate around that. But um, And then there's, you know, all these decisions for sign-offs and this, that and the other. But as I said, I keep trying to focus. I know that I have a product that can change people's lives and make them feel better. And I think everyone needs a little bit of that right now. I think where this has come in history and where we sit right now um, you know, still in a pandemic, people need this more so than ever than like five years ago. And Alex, if people want to learn more about you and what you're doing and the services that you offer, where can they go? It's performance laws, L-A-W-S, my last name, .com .au. Um, I'm, we're in the midst of doing massive rebranding right now. So you can see uh, that the website's there and then also you can just email me at alex at performancelaws.com.au. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not big on social, by the way. kind of made a, a, a conscious decision on that is I'm too busy trying to get outcomes for people. And like I did in America is I would rather provide such a good service to my clients that they then speak about what I've done. And that's what happened and why I crossed multiple codes of sport. I never advertised. I never spoke about it. I'd have people like you and Alyssa, you know, do articles on me. But it just doesn't um, it just doesn't gel with me with how I've worked in the past. So I put 150% into my clients to get the outcomes. and. Um, I'm just I'm I'm really really focused on getting that. I don't want to talk on social media to convince someone who just wants to read about you know uh, an objection or whatever I have on something to then uh, anyway. It's just not my thing. So you won't find a whole lot on social media on me to be honest with you. Just it's not my jam. I'm grateful for the stories and knowledge that you've shared in this conversation. So thanks so much for joining me. I really um, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Andrew. Such a pleasure. If you have questions, comments, feedback, or want to suggest a guest, please reach out to at Hardway Pod on social or email me at choosethehardway at gmail.com. Please take a moment to hit five stars in Spotify or iTunes and leave a one word review. That helps more people connect with the powerful stories my guests share. And I really appreciate the support. You are what you overcome. Choose the hard way.